Good afternoon uh, and welcome. Um, I'm Father Dorian Llewellyn. I'm the Executive Director of the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education at Santa Clara University. You know, uh, there's a certain conventionality about presenting speakers, and we often say, I am delighted and honored to welcome. Uh, in this case, it's actually far more the convention. Um, it's a delight to see, to welcome Dr. Hare again, because one of my first memories of meeting Kristen was actually in an interview process when I was being hired at LMU, where at that point she was assistant professor. Uh, somewhere, I think, in that first semester, there was a tenure review uh, in which Dr. Heyer was applying for, a, for associate professor status. So we sat in the department meeting, looked around at each other and said, well, that's not going to take very long, uh, because even at that point, her contributions to teaching, scholarship, and the public role of, uh, Cath of Catholic social teaching were so clearly of the very highest quality. Santa's, Santa Clara's gain was LMU's loss, and then after a distinguished citizenship here at this campus, uh, Santa Clara's loss became Boston College's gain. But in a way, in a way it's actually all gain, um, given Dr. Hayes' many, many contributions. Um, she is a scholar with an astonishing number of top quality publications in theological ethics, covering important topics that include healthcare, and the public role of religion in politics, but with a notable and very useful contribution on the highly important issues around immigration. She is also a much in demand speaker. I think about three invitations came in this afternoon. And uh, I also want to mention that apart from being a scholar of international repute, she's a wonderful colleague and actually tremendous fun to be around. So. Today's lecture actually marks, also marks the summit of the Ignatian Center's 2016 to 18 Bannon Institute. Is there a common good in our common home? A summons to solidarity. Over the last two years, 24 faculty from 17 different departments at Santa Clara and all of Santa Clara's five schools and colleges have met together regularly in cross-disciplinary seminars. Together, they have studied issues of justice in the areas of ethnicity and race, economics, gender, and the environment. And they have done that in dialogue with each other and also in dialogue with the ever-growing body of thought called Catholic social teaching. So through this 2016-18 Bannon Institute, the Ignatian Center has been very busy hosting an impressive range of public events four roundtable discussions, four lectures by members of the group of 24, four public lectures by scholars of distinction, and a highly successful podcast series. This is in addition to the quiet scholarly work of conversation, research, writing, publication, and other forms which have been the fruit of this series. So today's lecture by Dr. Heyer, Practicing Intellectual Hospitality, the Common Good, and the Work of Intellectual uh, and the Work of the Jesuit University, is an appropriate keystone for what has been an excellent and productive academic series that has enriched our campus intellectually. And I hope and I trust that that work will continue to find life in the classroom, in ongoing scholarship and teaching, in social engagement and in who our students will become. So, Dr. Heyer, it really is a delight and an honor for us to welcome you back. Thanks so much, Dorian, for that generous introduction. Uh, and thanks also to Mike and Hannah and Susan uh, at the Ignatian Center, and to Teresa Ladrick and Welpley for her multi-year vision for this Bannon Institute uh, and her invitations to join this cohort last September and again today. Um, my engagement with all of you has really been generative and very hopeful. Uh, it's also sincerely a delight to return to Santa Clara here, uh, which continues to inspire me from afar uh, with undertakings like this institute, dearly missed friends, and ridiculously nice weather. Uh, <laughs> we had icy rain in Boston last week. <laughs> uh, 
Um, since Teresa invited me two years ago, significant developments have unfolded on the national scene with implications for the idea of the common good in general and each of the Institute's foci in particular. Pursuit of an illusory understanding of national self-interest has replaced an impulse to collaborate toward global shared goods. Me Too and Charlottesville remind us how elusive racial, ethnic, and gender justice remain. Manipulative political rhetoric, the tribalization of partisanship, and our segmented social media feeds only complicate our shared task. Amid this wider cultural milieu, Catholic higher education institutions face significant changes, impacting their ability to live and transmit their mission. Some worry that the various pressures of a larger utilitarian and careerist culture governed by accreditation standards threaten Catholic identity. Most campuses wel welcome students formed more by technological habituation than faith traditions uh, and who are swiftly saddled with debt. Intellectual mistrust of religious truth claims and moral realism persist among faculty members as well, who are often drawn to teaching positions uh, in the present job market for a variety of reasons. Yet rehabilitating this idea of the common good offers an opportunity to at once anchor Catholic universities uh, in tradition and engage diverse stakeholders across different disciplines to critically develop its claims. Without minimizing the challenges posed by mutual suspicions, uh, aroused by the idea that the common good is identifiable on the one hand or irredis irreducibly pluralist in nature on the other, I think a robust interdisciplinary uh, engagement of the common good is well poised to make a contribution to the project of Catholic higher education. It offers an opportunity to integrate the educational experience of our students, counter-isolating tendencies in academia and fragmentation in the wider world, uh, and refine traditional understandings of the concept in need of renewal. Reflection on Catholic higher education has long welcomed the value of various intellectual traditions contributing in an atmosphere of academic freedom. Emphasizing the basic compatibility of the pursuit of knowledge with university's religious mission, this model rightly orients Catholic universities toward interdisciplinary uh, engagement of the concrete, interrelated aspects of human life. Catholic commitments attune participants to the pursuit of truth, justice, beauty, uh, holistic flourishing, and integral development. And they serve as questions about the ends of various knowledge uh, pursued. Such communities may consider how their reason is compassionate and their intelligence moved by mercy. The Catholic intellectual tradition that animates the distinctive identity of our Jesuit universities itself continues to accumulate insights uh, from the light of reason as well as the light of faith. Its heritage isn't static in its contents. It's rather a dynamic, cumulative, living heritage that has been developing throughout history. Assumptions or prior experiences may prevent some from encountering the tradition in that mode, however. Sometimes in practice, monologue masquerades as dialogue, uh, or live and let live becomes the modus operandi. Without jettisoning its distinctive, life-giving, often countercultural offerings, explicit attention to the Catholic intellectual tradition's growing edges um, in need of development could invite new stakeholders into candid dialogue about the shared goods to which we wish to orient our students, um, our institutions, and our wider society. A living tradition need not be threatened by this give and take, uh, for at their best, mutual exchanges can safeguard against insular fundamentalisms, engage connection to people's basic questions, um, further insight into reality. Um, so I'm calling it a praxis of intellectual hospitality, uh, which will perceive diversity not as a threat or an aberration to be tolerated, but a gift and an expression of Catholicity. The Catholic tradition also has ample grounds for engaging in such practices. Pope Francis, uh, viewed here with a penguin, <laughs> has renewed Vatican II's emphasis on the communal nature of the search for truth. Uh, I think we see this in his emphases on building cultures of encounter and his calls for bold candor and humility. A praxis of intellectual hospitality can help 
theological and philosophical reflection guard against collapsing into ideologies that seek to tame the mystery, as he has cautioned. His dialogue with the existential extremities paves this way. Uh, he pre prefers building bridges to building walls. In his apostolic exhortation on holiness issued earlier this month, Francis again underscored the need for encounter, noting, quote, when somebody has an answer for every question, it is a sign that they are not on the right road. His expressed preference for a street bound over a risk averse uh, and self-referential church, I think also provides an apt orientation for this hospitality. So whereas such encounters are consonant with Catholic uh, commitments, I think rare is the explicit invitation that makes clear uh, that this pluralism is a value in itself and that interdisciplinary engagement should be a two-way street, um, given the value and the finitude of the Catholic tr intellectual tradition. Encounter in this vein requires deep listening and the courage to genuinely engage beyond disciplinary familiarity and tempting echo chambers. A distinctively Catholic vision of the good, then, is appropriately light and leaven, as well as dynamic and emergent. Whereas an incarnational sense of mission integration may work more effectively when preaching to the choir or ensuring that they all sing in unison, uh, introducing strands accenting hospitality and humility and mutuality might incorporate the syncopated rhythms of the skeptical and initially dismissive or invite virtuosos into ensemble performances. So amid an interdisciplinary diverse community of uh, intellectual neighbors like those gathered here, I think the idea of the common good offers us a promising site for intellectual hospitality. The Catholic idea of the common good can resist dismissals as imperialistic throwback uh, or diluted sellout precisely as it remains thick yet thin, uh, rooted and yet underdetermined. So employed as a lens rather than a fixed body of doctrine, the idea is well poised to orient Jesuit education's uh, endeavors in its formative and countercultural modes, as well as these more inclusive collaborative modes. It offers opportunities for universities to advance shared goods as a countersign to market models of education, as well as engage interdisciplinary partners in refinement of its articulation and applications. So I think both the prophetic and collaborative modes are appropriate to Catholic ecclesiology, ethics, uh, and education. As you know, if you've been to these events for two years, uh, the idea of the common good has deep historical roots uh, in traditions of Western thought. Classic Greek philosophy shaped a vision of the good life, with Aristotle arguing the good of the community should guide individuals' lives and articulating the pursuit of the general welfare of the polis in contexts of participatory self-governance. Augustine and Aquinas built upon this understanding, uh, but conceived of the ultimate good uh, as fullness of life in God, such that the earthly common good may be achieved only partially or analogously. According to Aquinas, right relationship to God requires commitment to the common good of our neighbors and all creation. So this tradition, this Catholic common good tradition, is rooted in a vision of the human person as loved into being by God and created for relationship. Created in the imago dei and social and political by nature, persons are endowed with inviolable dignity and human rights. So according to this uh, anthropology, person's social nature is inherent, not extrinsic. And so human rights are claims to goods necessary for each to participate with dignity in common life. The tradition has elaborated dimensions of the temporal common good in increasingly expansive ways over recent decades, including uh, relations among sovereign states and questions of the global common good beginning in the 1960s. Gaudi Metzbez, uh, articulates its scope as the sum total conditions of social life, which allows social groups and their members thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. So a utilitarian calculus threatens to exclude individuals and groups, whereas the participation of every member is essential to Catholic common good theory. The option for the poor and vulnerable in the tradition seeks to incorporate disempowered and marginalized persons into full participation in the life of the community, enabling everyone to share in, but also contribute to the common good. For if the dignity of persons can be realized only in community, 
then genuine community can only exist where the substantial freedom and dignity of every human person is secured. The common good also not only refers to outcomes, uh, the telos of a given community, but also can serve as a hermeneutical lens. It does not offer an already out there, ready to be grasped norm of justice, but rather a set of goals to be arrived at through public debate and consensus. So it shapes the questions rather than the answers on this model. Um, David Hollenbach has articulated a concept of intellectual um, solidarity, uh, using this concept of the common good to kind of clarify competing values and engage fundamental questions. Um, and I think this approach can help us move beyond the silos of scholarly inquiry uh, or the reductive rhetoric that characterizes our contemporary discourse. The idea of the common good swims against cultural tides influencing students and faculty alike, whether moral privatism, market fundamentalism, emotivism, polarizing divisions, um, each of which really hardens resistance uh, to common understandings of shared realities, much less shared goods. The all-American credo that we pull up our bootstraps and make our own fate is perhaps as entrenched as it is incompatible with this solidaristic idea uh, that we share one another's fate. A culture in which good fences make good neighbors, either due to intellectual wariness or isolationist fears, hinders our deliberative engagement about common goods. Hence, to the extent that contemporary notions of liberal education reflect, uh, reflect utilitarian or libertarian perspectives, the common good orients Jesuit higher ed on a different trajectory. At the same time, the conception of the common good has been a developing one, undergoing expansion, refinement, in some cases even reversals. Robust interdisciplinary exchange can help ensure the common good tradition remains sufficiently attentive to new demands, insights from others, distorting blind spots. So I want to propose uh, joining this commitment to intellectual solidarity with a praxis of intellectual hospitality um, to signal that inclusive dialogue cannot remain on the host's terms if it is to remain true dialogue and foster genuine encounter. So interdisciplinary exchange at the growing edges. Whereas these substantive and procedural dimensions of the common good tradition serve to counter broader cultural currents, uh, at the same time, Jesuit universities would do well to galvanize collaboration across the disciplines to revise its understanding and applications. The good life of the Aristotelian polis held uh, appeal as long as you were not a woman or a slave. Intentionally widening the conversation could help alert Catholic intellectual communities to what common good talk can obscure and whom it excludes. For example, dialogue between philosophy and theology and social sciences yields deeper understandings of the way structures and ideologies limit uh, our grasp and pursuit of shared goods. Exchanges across literature and the arts can alert participants to the role that narratives and artifacts and aesthetic experiences play in shaping our imagination around shared goods. Attention to insights from gender studies and critical race studies serve to interrogate the classical subject and shed lights upon whose equal rights remain unequally violated, as Bill O'Neill puts it. Fostering interdisciplinary approaches in curricula and research together with opportunities for experiential learning holds promise, I think, for reinvigorating this idea of the common good uh, and enhancing the education of integrated persons. Even where human dignity is affirmed in law or a sensible social consensus about what constitutes the common good, um, we encounter those whose dignity is disproportionately endangered. Whether in racialized incidents of police violence, repressive abuse of religious minorities, or the pervasive exploitation of women. Causality is complex, but in many cases, the, um, I've lost my place. I know it's the ideal subject who's to blame. In many cases, the construal of the ideal subject uh, has served to harm dignity and freedom. So dialogue with anthropology, sociology, again, gender and race studies could help uncover some of these harmful assumptions and lacunae. Ideas about the complementarity of the sexes, for instance, often lurk below Catholic family ethics, 
bolstering unequal burdens for the work of social production with ontological status and religious sanction. So attending to interdisciplinary research on the concrete pressures facing families could help Catholic communities better appreciate the violence and fragility and cultural forces beyond relativism or sexual libertarianism that directly impact families' lives. This may illuminate how building up families uh, demand social supports that concretely value caregiving work uh, and authentically conveyed witness to the equal dignity of women and women's bodies. Data from last month's sweeping study on income inequality in the United States indicated the alarming divergence of prospects for African American boys from white boys when controlling for neighborhoods and household income, underscoring the pernicious reach of racism. Our conceptions of the common good and our universities have not been immune to compromising legacies of enslavement and racial inequality. So interdisciplinary indicators invite us to historical truth-telling and anti-racist work within our institutions. Georgetown University's public apology for its role in the slave trade and reparations to future applicants offers one example. As a history professor involved in the efforts there admits, critics may dismiss these efforts as politically correct on one hand or inadequate on the other. But one thing is certain, we are tending to a new landscape of historical memory. Findings from neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and psychology, moral psychology, about the significant role of non-rational factors um, suggest further cause for this robust exchange. If, as psychologist Jonathan Haidt has argued, reason is at best riding the elephant of our emotions uh, as it seeks to make the judgments of conscience, for example, Getting arguments about the common good is adequate, but it's not sufficient. Dialogue regarding how emotion, culture, imagination, uh, even the accidents of moral luck shape human discernment would benefit from uh, reflection on pursuit of shared goods in general uh, would, and would benefit our student formation in particular. Attending to non-rational factors that inhibit our interconnectedness requires further engagement with social science disciplines that shed light on these modes uh, of resistance. Oftentimes, Catholic understandings of discernment uh, on an individual level assume um, unencumbered autonomous agents, uh, which can overlook these significant contexts that constrain people's agency. Um, so structural violence, social geometries of power, engaging those conversations, I think could more adequately reflect how actual people reflect and act. So I think interdisciplinary exchange can uh, illuminate the complexities of pursuing the common good amid these dynamics that harm and conceal. At the same time, a transcendent orientation may prove valuable rather than threatening to secular disciplines in the face of these complex dynamics. Climate change specialists have admitted the planet's chief environmental problems may not be biodiversity loss or ecosystem collapse, but greed and apathy, requiring a spiritual transformation that climate science and policy paradigms alone remain ill-equipped to address. At a Jesuit university facing threats to our common home entails analyzing climate data and pursuing justice and evoking reverence. Laudato Si has offered an avenue for interdisciplinary conversation around a shared planetary good already on this campus. The encyclical emphasizes the interconnected nature of social and environmental harms and their redress in terms of an integral ecology. Its scriptural and theological foundations drive home the relational significance of the ways in which we tread daily, um, how we eat and wait and commute, much less vote and spend. These relational claims at the root of the common good tradition, I think, are fundamental to Pope Francis's integral ecology. He writes, if a person grows more, matures more, is sanctified more, to the extent he or she enters relationships, including with all creatures, then I think we're called to penetrate the soap bubbles of indifference, even if we can afford to presume environmental peril is not yet our problem. In its summons to a far-reaching ecological conversion, Laudato Si highlights entrenched barriers to encountering the marginalized and the earth with compassion and justice. I think throughout his papacy, Pope Francis has underscored these attitudes that harm people 
um, and planet alike. Not just personal choices or policy priorities, but pervasive mindsets that really shape our loyalties. A technocratic paradigm uh, that conditions lifestyles and possibilities, a cheerful recklessness, and anesthetizing consumerism. So countering unjust environmental practices and the lack of political will to reverse them um, entails, I think, interrogating these deeper totalizing worldviews that legitimate them. Our harmful illusions of isolated living function to perpetuate, perpetuate and deny complicity in these webs of injustice. And yet, the encyclical's first and last words are not of doomsday, um, but hope in humans' capacity to enact positive change. Whereas the Pope is unflinching in his prophetic criti criticisms, the tone remains one of hope and praise and humility. Um, with his own lived examples of simplicity and Ignatian spirituality, he embodies a sense that an authentic humanity able to contemplate beauty and overcome reductionism is dwelling in the midst of our culture unnoticed, likening it to a mist seeping gently beneath a closed door. I recall that the power of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring lay precisely in how she linked attentiveness to the fragile beauty of the natural world, to unmasking uh, efforts to endanger it. I can still remember vividly 25 years after uh, my first reading, her warnings to a public felt fed little tranquilizing pills of half-truths uh, and sugar-coated unpalatable facts. So your students might remember something you've assigned <laughs> after the quarter ends. She questioned whether any civilization can wage relentless war on life without destroying itself, without losing the right to be called civilized. She did so not only by exposing the impact of chemical pesticides, but celebrating the place of the picturesque fiddler crab in its delicate ecology, heeding the mute testimony of dead ground squirrels, and lamenting the coming of spring increasingly unheralded by the return of chickadees, robins, and cardinals. So Carson's mode was not unlike Francis's prophetic indictments joined with wonder, and perhaps offers insight into how we as educators might evince credibility for the urgency of this parallel summons to care for our common home. Several years prior uh, to Francis's promulgation of Laudato Si, uh, President Michael Eng here identified as his signature institutional priority the pursuit of environmental sustainability linked to social justice. Invoking Mary Oliver's Song of the Builders, he noted how Catholic universities engage interdisciplinary work to help students build the universe, as her poem concludes, uh, and how our shared goals require contemplation. She sat down to think about God, and her attention focused on the cricket. In an Ignatian key, he suggested creating spaces for reflection on questions of ultimate meaning can similarly lead to a closer observation uh, of our world, and that that's what we do in Jesuit education. Um, commit ourselves to notice all living beings, whether an insect or an individual person. Educators face steep challenges in fostering contemplative attentiveness in our students. Here in Silicon Valley, you're particularly aware of how students' digital maximalism or pursuit of a hyper-connected life not only drives them away from the solitude needed for self-reflection, but it also risks superficial engagement and isolation. Consequent multitasking has adverse consequences for the life of the mind, but also for the common good. Even as users rack up followers and likes, digital technologies have fostered a sense of networked individualism rather than meaningful networks of social support an incessant interruption, uh, the fact that mobile technology has made us all pausable, as Sherry Turkle puts it, leads to isolation from relationships and a spirit of absent presence. So what does it mean to form a generation of students who have been absorbed by technology? As consumer psychology expert Nir Eyal reflects, an app succeeds when it meets the user's most basic emotional needs before she even becomes consciously aware of them. When you're feeling uncertain, before you ask why you're uncertain, you Google. 
When you're lonely, before you're even conscious of feeling it, you go onto Facebook or Instagram. Before you know you're bored, you're on YouTube. Nothing tells you to do these things. The users trigger themselves. So for today's generation of students beholden to such behavioral design marketing, uh, which I think habituates retreats from the beauty of the redwoods, um, but also from primary texts that take patient attentiveness, um, from genuine communion, and into alternate realities by unthinking choice. Uh, in this case, we face not only indifference, but in some important sense, captivity. If our Jesuit campuses can instead cultivate interiority, our students will be more primed to seek depth in interactions, ordinary interactions, and resist the urge to fill every free moment with a digitally mediated interaction. They might instead look beyond their screens into the wonders of the world around them. Hence, in spite of interdisciplinary correctives, Barriers thwarting the promise uh, and pursuit of the common good persist beyond our disciplinary silos alone. Cultural barriers, such as these isolating technologies, um, as well as institutional barriers, such as risk aversion and the function of ideas about meritocracy. The 2016 Bannon Lecture Series considered what was at stake for the common good in this election in terms of racial and ethnic justice, gender, environmental, and economic justice. In the year and a half since, making America great has given cover to exclusionary tax and refugee policies, racialized scapegoating, and exit from international agreements. At the same time, votes of college-educated middle class white men and women informed the election's outcomes as much as the votes of the working class. Higher education scholar Dafina Lazarus Stewart suggests that historically white universities engagement of a politics of appeasement rather than genuinely liberal education is in part to blame in this regard. She contends that in substituting diversity and inclusion rhetoric for transformative efforts to promote equity and justice, colleges have avoided recognizable institutional change. So just as Laura Nichols' research shows how Catholic universities too often perpetuate rather than challenge economic inequalities through status quo admissions and enrollment practices uh, that favor students from wealthy families, Stewart indicates how assumptions about meritocracy impede transformative pedagogy. She laments that despite inclusive excellence programming or core diversity requirements, most students leave college with the same assumptions as when they entered, that the dominance and overrepresentation of certain people in college, in leadership, uh, among the, the ranks of the wealthy and envied is natural and optimal, and that advancement and opportunity is exclusively a function of merit, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. So an option for the marginalized as constitutive of the common good underscores the limitation of diversity and inclusion language alone. So she asks questions to distinguish these, like diversity asks who's in the room, and equity responds who's trying to get into the room but can't, right? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure. So even as Stewart insists inclusion falls short, many of our institutions have yet to reckon with their histories of exclusion as well. Uh, further compromising their ability to challenge myths of meritocracy in pursuit of a truly shared good. Paving a path forward, Tony Hazard's integral podcast invites white allies to divest from unearned privilege and our badges of authority. So I would like to turn in conclusion now to surfacing some additional virtues and practices for pursuing the common good in this university home. So whereas the barriers remain formidable, in my view, the, view uh, the work of the Spannon Institute has reflected the growing edges and dynamic nature of the common good tradition in this vein of intellectual hospitality. They've modeled what it might look like for faculty from diverse backgrounds and disciplines uh, to co-author the tradition, to identify distortions or oversights, and really to claim a stake in institutional identity. In my own experience, this can be complicated bridge building work. 
It demands avoiding the human temptation to generalize, to assume lived Catholicism is irredeemable patriarchy uh, or blameless beacon, uh, or the temptation to plead incommensurability because basically our disciplines reward staying in our own lean. If many continue to fear the common good as either fascism <laughs> or an artifact to be protected and safeguarded, then I think the need to be bilingual in our ability to speak to both the promise and the limits of this tradition is ever urgent. So moving forward, what virtues could help Jesuit universities risk mutual engagement beyond surface encounters to reinvigorate this tradition? Um, I forget how much time I have. Mike, how am I on time? Great, I'll give you all three virtues then. Um, <laughs> um, the first two draw from the standard virtue of solidarity, which typically helps agents to commit to the common good. Um, but I would like to raise, instead of intellectual or institutional solidarity, conflictual and incarnational solidarities to start. So conflictual solidarity first. Another growing edge of the Catholic common good tradition reflects its tendency to prioritize unity, harmony, and synthesis in ways that circumvent conflict. Some observ observers have characterized the tradition's development of solidarity as marked by caution at the service of safeguarding social peace. Brian Massengale employs the work of Frederick Douglass and Malcolm X as correctives to this tendency, noting that the African American tradition is severely critical of a solidarity without social struggle. In contrast to the dominant approach that presumes that imbued with the virtue of solidarity, social elites will voluntarily undertake practices of dispossession, uh, he suggests conflictual solidarity takes seriously how the virtue is lived in the midst of reality marked by social conflict and really attuned to exploited subjects. Warnings that social Catholicism underestimates both the recalcitrance of the privileged uh, and the potential power of the dispossessed are well taken. Um, often recalcitrance only yields in the face of demands and determined pressure. Uh, he describes in response cross-racial solidarity as entailing lament uh, and transformative love to avoid these superficial palliatives that leave the deep roots of injustice uh, undisturbed. So as a virtue orienting our common task, it demands Jesuit universities interrogate our histories of complicity that may have been suppressed and pursue justice even where it entails some disruption or sacrifice. And passing today the white crosses in front of the mission evoke the central place of the Uka martyrs in the memory and orientation of this campus. They remind me in particular of the visit of John Sabrino to campus in 2009, commemorating the 20th anniversary of the martyrdom. He lamented then how difficult it is for universities to look at the world. He said it is easier for us to look at the moon um, and called us to take our scholarly competencies and fix our gaze on the crucified persons of the world and bear a readiness to encounter life there, life where it shouldn't be, he said. So what might it mean to consider solidarity in costly ways, even if not um, demanding literal martyrdom? I think commitment to the common good may require relinquishing power and privilege in ways that um, challenge the status quo. I was thinking my students were, were surprised to learn this semester that oftentimes migrant women's work abroad does not change um, child rearing responsibilities back at home. Uh, that with grandmothers and aunts employed in countries of origin, often transnational mothers gendered work of social production remains intact, right? Helping with homework via cell phones after sending remittances home. So there hasn't been a disruption of the privilege in some ways. And I think the recalcitrance of the privileged may demand more conflictual modes of solidarity. So for instance, the bold example of student survivors uh, in Parkland, Florida last month attunes us to this mode sharing their platform to make clear that whether in Chicago or Oakland or Parkland, you have a right to go to a safe school and calling out politicians BS, they mobilized over a million to, cross, uh, to march across the country. So promoting the common good can't bypass conflict and it may disrupt comfortable fictions for our students and for ourselves. Uh, connected to that is incarnational solidarity. 
So perhaps some of you were like one in five Americans who protested in marches uh, since the beginning of 2016. I know many people on my campus took note uh, when Father Eng joined you all in the DACA walkout and march, joined many of you, as I understand, the largest walkout in the school's history. But even watching from afar, uh, whether coverage of the Women's March or Black Lives Matter marches, you can sense that these are not affairs of intellectual solidarity alone. They are embodied, visceral, singing, chanting, marching, meeting strangers face to face. And I think given the depth and lure that challenges um, resistance to solidarity in parts, um, not to mention the insulating temptations of the academy, that intentionally cultivating an incarnational solidarity remains critical to formation for the common good. So an incarnational solidarity undertakes embodied practices of presence and service to the real world. Christine Freer Hinsey describes the virtue in terms of cultivating concrete habitual ways of acknowledging our being with the neighbor, especially the suffering neighbor. And she distinguishes it from the cheap, virtual, or sentimental forms of solidarity proffered by a consumer culture. She highlights consumerist culture's use of seduction and misdirection to lay a soothing mantle over systemic injustices that solidarity would expose. Um, participants are fitted with Oz-like lenses, fed a stream of distractions and novelties, ensuring they will pay no attention to the suffering multitudes behind the curtain. So encounters by way of experience are frequently more likely to interrupt complacency uh, and reform our imagination than our abstract principles alone. Uh, Dean Brackley talks about this as cognitive hygiene, uh, acting ourselves into new ways of thinking. Uh, so this campus has a lot of opportunities for immersive and community-based learning um, that I think can productively challenge students' paradigms for understanding social problems. Uh, and their solutions. Third, I would add institutional courage. So calling for conflictual and incarnational solidarity may seem far-fetched for inherently risk-averse institutions engaged in the intellectual life. So I conclude with this final virtue. I think reckoning with our complicity and injustice and pursuing more sacrificial forms of solidarity may challenge administrators leading our institutions in pursuit of a shared good um, with courage and vision. I have a colleague uh, who serves as both a faculty member and a department chair and sits on the board of trustees at another university. And she recently confessed that some of these hats she wears invite her to pursue social justice driven by transformative pedagogy um, and other hats to safeguard university brand driven by risk assessment and the bottom line. Preoccupation with safeguarding against risks can impede a culture of encounter. Whereas becoming the first medical school in the country to openly welcome DACA students was not uncomplicated, Loyola Chicago's first cohort is now fully placed in residency programs for their upcoming graduation. So among faculty, we might ask ourselves what spaces we consciously cultivate in our classrooms when urgent signs of the time threaten the common good in our common home. The cohorts spoke last fall about how we locate Charlottesville in the history of race in this country, uh, white privilege, toxic masculinity, um, even though it would be far easier to simply update past syllabi or safeguard our student evaluations as we approach promotion. Some racist events on my own campus soon thereafter uh, gave me the opportunity to, as one of my students put it, lean in to the discomfort of confronting the topic as it hit close to home in an ideologically diverse class before we had the luxury of building trust um, or getting there in the syllabus, treating that, those topics. But I think beyond the classroom, we might reflect on where we're being invited to courage uh, in our research agendas or our lives as public intellectuals. I think if the idea of the common good is to animate Jesuit universities, we must ensure the concept becomes less heady and static, that it is lived. So my intellectual hospitality proposal may risk hopeless idealism uh, or pitch too big a tent in the eyes of some. This two-year institute, I think, indicates some promising signs to the contrary, however. Um, and I was recently inspired by another sign of hope, reading Ali Narani's book, There Goes the Neighborhood, 
Um, he's a first generation Pakistani American raised nearby in Santa Cruz. I think he's admittedly not very religious. Um, but he traveled the country trying to find out where immigrant rights activists went wrong. Um, in that, that recent year. He said most of his colleagues waged a political value, uh, battle, attempting to change minds with data, um, and neglected to appreciate that the country was having a cultural debate about identity and values. So his encounters with Baptist peach farmers in South Carolina, and sheriffs in Utah, and Texas businessmen, I thought offer a, a encouraging model for those seeking to forge common ground across difference. He concludes in the book, we need to be able to meet people where they are, but not leave them there. So given the urgency of the stakes, may we too risk bilingual bridge building uh, work in our common university homes. Thank you. Thanks. So I would now like to invite the four Bannon faculty fellows to the stage, and they will now offer their own reflections and response, after which we'll have time for discussion. So thank you, Kristen, um, for your insightful words, particularly as they relate to cultivating the common good um, in our common university home. I also want to give a thank you to Father Dorian um, for shepherding us along as, as um, the Bannon Institute. So I am Brett Solomon. I am faculty in the Child Studies program, and I've been honored to lead the Racial and Ethnic Justice Faculty Collaborative for the past two years. And I represent an outstanding and dynamic group of faculty colleagues I like to call soul friends, including Margaret Russell in the Law School, Shin Yi Chang in Communications, Father William O'Neill in the Jesuit School of Theology, Cruz Medina in English, and our newly tenured member, Anthony Hazard, in Ethnic Studies. We, as a collaborative, would like to extend a heartfelt thanks um, and lots of gratitude to Teresa for her fortitude and vision behind making this all happen. Um, we're eternally grateful to her. We, we're the legacy, even though she's been gone for, I don't know, three weeks, we're her legacy. Um, so. Just this last month, my 95-year-old grandmother, Hazel Lee, was honored by the National Alumni Association of Spelman College as the founder of their Los Angeles chapter in 1955. So Hazel founded the chapter in honor of her mother, my great-grandmother, Idini Fitzgerald, who graduated from Spelman in 1916. Hazel's vision for the chapter was social justice, support, and advocacy, during a time of tremendous racial and ethnic turmoil in the United States. Located in Atlanta, Georgia, Spelman College is our country's only all-female HBCU, or historically black college or university. Supported by the US government, HBCUs were founded in the 1800s as a means of providing places of higher learning for African Americans who were not allowed to attend all white colleges or universities. Spelman served and still does as a place of academic rigor, support, and empowerment for African American women who were, and some would argue still are, considered unequal and inferior in the United States. As I listen to the intelligent, insightful African American women reflect on how Spelman prepared them for the world, I was reminded of the pure light that existed amidst the social and racial storm that surrounded my great-grandmother and my grandmother in the 19th and 20th centuries. I was reminded of the framework for racial and ethnic justice that generations before ours started, but now we were charged to finish. I was reminded of the common good in our common home. Being constituted in the spring of 2016, 100 years after my great-grandmother graduated, 
um, from Spelman, our racial and ethnic justice faculty collaborative did not anticipate the threats um, to racial and ethnic justice that would be resurrected in our country. Our response involved discerning topics such as racism and white allyship, rhetoric and cultural deficiency, immigration, assimilation and difference, relational citizenship, implicit bias, the preschool to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, and truth and reconciliation. Just to name a few points, a few points of entry that we employed towards finding a common good in our common homes. Being part of the Racial and Ethnic Justice Faculty Collaborative has shaped our work as teachers and scholars in multiple ways. It's provided us with the space and time for our vocational and intellectual commitments to racial and ethnic justice by learning the perspectives of varied disciplines and applying them to our own. The engaged dialogue between has been immensely valuable by deepening our understanding of interdisciplinary resources for understanding the history, nature, and implications of racism and ethnic bias today. Our common commitment has fostered a rich and critical conversation in which we have learned from and supported one another in our vocation as engaged scholars at this very most critical time in our world's history, in our nation's and world's history. As Kristen Heyer said in her talk, the virtue of solidarity helps agents commit to common good at every entry level in a habitual and persevering way. Today we carry on that virtue of solidarity in our work towards social justice, support, and advocacy for our most vulnerable populations. So have we contributed to the framework for racial and ethnic justice set forth by generations before us? set forth by our grand and great grandmothers who sacrificed so much of themselves so that each of us in this room would have a common good in our common homes. Contributed, yes. Finished, no. However, we certainly have moved the needle on finding the common good in our common home within and beyond the university. Simply stated, Involvement in the Racial and Ethnic Justice Faculty Collaborative has served to enhance the common good in our common home. It is our hope that the next generation of faculty scholars, with the voices of our ancestors at their backs and solidarity as a virtue as their guide, continues to charge towards racial, ethnic, and social justice and support and advocacy for our most vulnerable populations on campus and in our local, national, and global communities. Thank you. That's you, Bill. Uh, well, uh, welcome. I'm uh, Bill Sundstrom. I'm a professor in the Department of Economics. I was the uh, faculty fellow leading up the uh, economic justice and the common good collaborative. Uh, I'm going to start also with a couple of thanks, in particular to Kristen Heyer for her really stimulating uh, address, uh, which now having read a couple times and, and heard it, I'm beginning to absorb it, um, and uh, for her participation uh, earlier in the, in the process of the Bannon Institute. Uh, many thanks to the Ignatian Center and uh, to Father Dorian and others as affiliated with it for their support of this remarkable uh, cross-disciplinary and collaborative process. And of course to Teresa ladrigan uh whose uh, brainchild it was and who really shepherded us through two years of, of exploration uh, for her vision and embodiment, I think, of practicing intellectual hospitality. I'm going to take a somewhat different uh, tack and, and talk a little bit about my own um, uh, reaction to, to Kristen's framework for thinking about this. Uh, I'm an outsider, uh, admittedly, to the Catholic and Jesuit tradition, uh, but I have to say I really welcome Kristen's articulation of a strategy for the university to affirm and strengthen its Catholic identity while engaging with and learning from other traditions and viewpoints. As she puts it, pluralism is not a regrettable necessity but a value in itself. I'm also really drawn to her idea that the common good offers a common ground or paradigm for engaging a pluralistic community of scholars. Indeed, for me, these ideals have helped 
make Santa Clara University a welcoming place to engage in the work of teaching scholarship and active participation in helping to run the university. In my brief remarks about her rich essay, I want to stress a couple of points. First, I want to draw some connections, which she really invites, I think, between her theologically grounded conception of the common good and some more secular conceptions, what I think of as, as sort of my tradition of liberal humanism uh, uh, in the, thinking about the common good, and secondly, to identify a few tensions around the relationship between justice and the common good. Why should we expect there to be an identifiable common good or goods in our world? One answer is that there exist some goods that all members of a community have to share. And by that, I, I think of common resources, the commons uh, we talk a lot about in, in environmental studies and in economics, for example, clean air. There are also goods that nearly all members of a society or community agree have value, and perhaps something like the right of all children to safety and nurturing, although we see many um, exceptions to that in practice. Over what kinds of common goods might we find wide agreement? Uh, in his book, Political Liberalism, John Rawls suggests that in a complex modern society, people pursue a wide plurality of potentially contradictory and competing ends or notions of the good but in a well-ordered society can still be sustained by an overlapping consensus, as he puts it, of reasonable doctrines. Now, there's something kind of dissatisfying about this idea. It's very thin, I think of it as kind of a Venn diagram conception of the terrain of the common good. And you have to think that uh, given the polarized nature of current politics and moral frameworks, you have to wonder whether this overlapping set uh, has been nearly squeezed out to what we would call an empty set in math mathematics. Kristen's alternative approach to defining the common good, informed by Catholic social teaching, uh, rests on what she refers to as uh, a theological anthropology. One starting point of this approach is the assumption that humans are fundamentally social, as she said, and that as a general rule, human thriving can only exist in a thriving community. But what kind of community? Not all communities are created equal. One can imagine, and in fact observe quite frequently, communities that appear to provide deep connections and even solidarity among their members while simultaneously excluding some persons from membership and or compromising the rights and dignity of some members by subordinating or repressing them. A just community then, both common and good, is one that meets an additional requirement. Specifically, it is one that respects the rights and dignity of each person. In Kristen's case, the fundamental dignity of each person again derives from a theological premise, the notion that each individual is created in God's image and is thus is endowed with inviolable dignity and human rights. Putting it all together, she writes, person's social nature is inherent, not in extrinsic, so human rights are claims to goods necessary for each to participate with dignity in community life. I find this a really attractive formulation, and uh, one reason uh, is that I need not embrace Kristen's theological justification for it, but can instead uh, draw upon secular justice traditions I'm more familiar with and indeed more comfortable with. There are powerful versions of something like this, not identical, but something like it in the liberal humanist tradition uh, that arrive at a pretty similar endpoint from rather different first principles. And uh, you know, a philosopher I particularly admire in this regard is Ronald Dworkin, uh, who wrote about equality as a sovereign virtue and one that uh, admits of uh, a, a, a rich community life uh, as well as uh, personal equality and, and freedom. So perhaps there's some uh, overlapping consensus uh, after all. Uh, I'm gonna, not going to have time to run through my entire comments on justice and the common good, uh, but I think uh, the Institute itself had to ask the titular sort of question, is there a common good in our common home? The participants in the collaboratives uh, examined the issue framed specifically in terms of justice in the common good, uh, racial and ethnic justice in the common good, environmental justice, and so forth. Uh, in my economic justice collaborative, and I suspect ours is not alone in this, we've spent a lot more time thinking about and talking about justice or injustice than about the common good, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. Justice concerns often arise in contexts where the common good is fundamentally contested or simply has little influence as a motivation for the actual behavior that determines the distribution of rights, benefits, and privileges. In the world of competing interests and divisions based on race, ethnicity, gender, and class, 
common good talk may not get us all that far. Convincing captains of industry that they really will be better off living in a thriving community where they relinquish much of their wealth to the economically marginalized may be less effective in promoting economic justice than identifying uh, realistic policies and collective actions that can nudge the political equilibrium in the right direction. And indeed, I think Kristen um, engages this problematic quite uh, explicitly in her brief but very powerful discussion, I think, of conflictual solidarity. That's exactly what we're driving at there. Um, I'm going to just close with a, a very uh, short, uh, I hope, a kind of a friendly amendment to Kristen's talk uh, coming uh, from, from outside uh, the tradition. Uh, in her vision of intellectual hospitality, the Jesuit Catholic University invites those from outside the Catholic tradition into the university's common home. And that's uh, a very comforting uh, and welcome notion. As someone who's made Santa Clara University my intellectual and professional home for just over 30 years, I'm inclined, respectively, to decline the invitation or, alternatively, to issue my own. This already is my home, too. Uh, it's our home. Uh, so to my way of thinking, the university is to me, first and foremost, a community of scholars, defined broadly as faculty, students, and staff, and its mission and character are defined by the ever-evolving shared engagement and values of the members of that community. Jesuit Catholic identity is an aspect of mission and character that has special resonance, obviously, for, for many here, given the history and traditions of our community. But for me, and I would say for many of my colleagues, it's not defining. Uh, as a university, then, uh, we pursue a, a variety of core values. Uh, some, my, my list overlaps with, uh, with Kristen's that she mentioned. Truth, beauty, wisdom, I might add liberation. And her address invites us to affirm that the study and pursuit of the common good really deserves an important, uh, perhaps central place among these shared values in our common university home. That's an invitation that many of us can join her in issuing to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for that rich and insightful talk. It's clear how much your call to practice intellectual hospitality shaped the structure of this particular incarnation of the Bannon Institute. So my apologies for referencing a cheesy line from a Nicholas Sparks novel that was cheesily further done in a Kevin Costner film. But I feel like we're missing our true north here today. And I want to extend my deepest gratitude to Teresa for her visionary leadership in creating the, the Bannon faculty collaborative, and then two for creating one that was dedicated to gender justice and the common good. Uh, as Kristen noted, the particular ruptures on a national and global scale that have taken place within the time frame of this two-year institute were many. The idea of a common good, however complicated and fraught it might be, gave us a meaningful foundation to turn to in a socio-political moment characterized by violence, hate, and a tremendous sense of precarity. In her talk, Kristen spoke of the Catholic intellectual tradition as one that is living and dynamic, and one that is enriched, not diluted, by the presence of new and different stakeholders. One where interfaith and interdisciplinary participation elevates both the discourse but also the praxis. Teresa's genius was recognizing the good that was already present in our SEU faculty community and harnessing that energy to engage four of the most significant and salient issues we face in this moment in history. Kristen suggested that the common good be adopted as a lens rather than a fixed body of doctrine, and one that enables us to shift out of both the isolationism of academic life and the reductionism of contemporary political discourse. This evolving good, she suggests, will benefit from intellectual hospitality manifested in an interdisciplinary dialogue and exchange. I would add that what I experienced in this institute was spiritual hospitality as well, in that uh, in that while it sought to advance the Catholic intellectual tradition, I never felt peripheral or tokenized as a non-Catholic participant in it, or to draw on Kristen's language that I was never made to feel bound by the host's terms. Today's talk offered a powerful inventory of the potential of sustained interdisciplinary engagement. It was a tremendous privilege and honor to serve as a faculty fellow for the Gender Justice and the Common Good Collaborative Group. Though it's just the tip of the iceberg, I'd like to underscore how diverse and complex and multi-layered the scholarly output of a group framed around the idea of gender justice and the common good can be. I think the work of my collaborative partners speaks to the value and generative, generativity of sustained interdisciplinary dialogue. So 
so I'm going to talk a little bit about my partner's work. We had the privilege of reading and discussing Stephanie Wildman and Adam Chang's Law Journal article, Gender Insight, Examining Culture and, Cultural, Culture and Constructions of Gender, a paper which seeks to both provide deeper understandings of gender and underline the presence of gender in daily life, ensuring that gender is indeed in sight. The paper begins by reviewing a brief evolution of the social construction of gender in US society, followed by a discussion of why the gender binary remains so problematic. It then looks more closely at recent attempts to expand understandings of gender and the barriers to, barriers to inclusive gender equality, ultimately outlining the elements for gender insight as a daily practice of both seeing gender and making inclusive community building decisions to broaden society's understanding of gender minority people. We had the great pleasure of reading and discussing chapters of Socorro Castaneda Lyles' book, Our Lady of Everyday Life, La Virgen de Guadalupe, and the Catholic Imagination of Mexican Women in America. Her work offers a groundbreaking sociological study and analysis of Mexican origin women and how they are socialized into Mexican Catholicism and how they trans transgress limiting notions of what a good Catholic woman should be. Through the nexus of faith and lived experience, Socorro argues that women develop a type of Mexican Catholic imagination that allows them to transgress strict notions of what a good Catholic woman should be while retaining life-giving aspects of Catholicism. We had the honor of engaging Sonia McKenzie's research project, Gender Justice, Gender Through the Eyes of Children, a photo voice project with elementary school, gender expansive, and LGBTQ parented children and their allies. Recently published in the journal Sex Education, the powerful project asks, how do, we, how do children experience gender? What are the roles of schools, adults, and allies in supporting gender inclusion in a world of gendered categories? The paper is a powerful example of grounded activist scholarship that aims to build more inclusive school environments in which children can come into their fully gendered selves. We read rich and theoretically innovative chapters from Maitri Jagathisan's forthcoming book, Unbecoming Cooley, Gender, Labor, and Decolonial Desires on Sri Lanka's Plantations. Her ethnographic research on hill country Tamils reveals how they are engaging in a process of unbecoming what their ancestors were in Sri Lanka's heritage of indentured to wage labor and are moving toward how they want to be seen and recognized in the country's present and future. In her work, Maitri invokes the, con the concept of contingent solidarities, which we might think of in relation to some of the more nuanced analytics of solidarity, conflictual solidarity, incarnational solidarity that Kristen's talk today referenced. Last, we had the opportunity to read and discuss chapters from Patrick Lopez Aguado's recently published book, Stick Together and Come Back Home, Racial Sorting and the Spillover of Carcer Carceral Identity. Patrick's work examines how what happens inside a prison affects what happens outside it. Carefully tracing the lives of 70 youth and adults as they navigate juvenile justice and penal facilities before re finally returning home, he outlines how institutional authorities structure a carceral social order that racially and geographically divides criminalized populations into gang-associated affiliations. These affiliations come to shape one's exposure, both to, exposure to both violence and criminal labeling. As they spill over the institutional walls, they establish how these unfold in high incarceration neighborhoods, as well, uh, reveal, uh, sorry, how these unfold in high incarceration neighborhoods as well revealing the insidious consequences that mass incarceration holds for poor communities of color. I encourage you to read all of this amazing work. I think we need a Bannon faculty collaborative um, repository of some sort. Uh, in, my, in my Bannon uh, Explore essay, I offered a brief lens into the outcomes of interdisciplinary dialogue and exchange by discussing Stephanie and my work on a feminist legal judgments project and each of the collaborative members' valuable input into the development of that piece and its evolution. <laughs> Concepts like interdisciplinarity, intellectual hospitality, common good, and solidarity can at, time feels, can, at time feel, sorry, can at times feel like utopian or abstract ideals when disconnected from tangible results and outcomes. 
I believe the work of the Gender Justice Collaborative and the collective energy and investments of the four collaboratives as a group, when coupled with Kristen's call for institutional courage, make me hopeful and optimistic about the transformative potential of our work as teacher scholars, who remain deeply grounded in the lived realities and struggles that characterize the world around us, and that must shape, and that must shape our work if, indeed, our commitment as an institution uh, to social justice is to be realized. Thank you. A Native American colleague once reminded us to plant seeds that will germinate in a time beyond our own. And that's exactly what my colleague, uh, Teresa Langwin Ripley, has done, and thanks for her leadership um, in this institute. I hope that all of us in this room will have the wisdom to water these young seedlings and with our careful attention, the courage to allocate the time and resources needed to fertilize, prune, and tend them as they grow stronger. And eventually, I am fully confident they will lead to new fruits of possibility. I'll skip all the thank yous because they've been said and I concur. Um, and I want to just briefly examine some resonances from Kristen's talk as they relate to our own collaborative. I'm Chris Bacon from the Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences, and I've had the gift of really serving as the faculty fellow for the Environmental Justice and the Common Good Collaborative. I'm going to talk, uh, environmental justice is a social movement's demand for change. It's a field for interdisciplinary scientific inquiry. And it's also um, a, an emerging area for dynamic env environmental policy making. It can be defined as the right of all people to healthy, livable communities where they live, work, learn, eat, play, and pray. And thanks to the pioneering work of the National Peoples of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in Washington, D.C. in 1991, uh, 1991, we have common principles and this definition. Part of the EJ as a social movement started in North Carolina um, by, um, when the government attempted to dump carcinogenic polychlorinated biphenyls spilled by Ward Transformer Company in the 1970s in Warren County. It's one of the lowest income communities with 75% African American um, population. They linked together with civil rights leaders and thanks to the pioneering scholarship of people like Robert Bullard, we realized there were patterns of environmental disparities and across the country and environmental racism was recognized as a concept. Some small policy changes started to happen. Of course, we see links here to the Racial and Ethnic Justice Collaborative uh, from the very beginning. I think part of the interest here is how these collaborators relate to each other. This history inspired uh, us as participants in the Bannon Institute's Environmental Justice Collaborative. And we have, for example, Professor Siming Yang as he interrogates how the 1964 Civil Rights Act could play a more significant role in shaping environmental policy by mandating careful consideration of the marginal community voices and moving towards corrective environmental justice. And this work has been done both inside the Environmental Protection Agency where there's policy makers and with social movement um, organizations. Jasmine Yamas is another EJC, our Environmental Justice Collaborative member studying air pollution risks in, here in San Jose. Um, and three EJ collaborative projects confront the hungry farmer paradox and learn from the sustainable farmers in Nicaragua as Ira Stewart Fry, Ed Maurer, and I study agriculture, food security, water security during climatic and market disruptions. Long-term partnerships that I helped to establish with cooperatives and universities as, and organic farmers now benefit from wider insights thanks to the work of IRIS um, in, in terms of producing research, cl climate variability maps, and, and helping to monitor local water systems. Ed Maurer's assessment of how climate change could, ch could affect the precipitation patterns has led to new perceptions as we realize a disconnection between work that identifies the way farmers perceive precipitation change versus the way climate scientists talk about, combining my own ethnographic work with the climate modeling efforts. However, many farmers are neither partnered with researchers nor are they linked to strong cooperatives, like don't, um, and they struggle to make ends meet. Often unable, they face this unfair challenge between poverty or poison, where they need to work on large plantations and day laborers. This isn't unsimilar from the work that's faced by farm workers here in California, and this ins inspired the 1950s and 60s when United Farm Workers co-founder Dolores Huerta, who will be on campus later on this month, uh, or next month, started organizing for better wages and against disproportionate environmental exposures. And this advocacy was one of the first to establish stricter regulation protecting workers from pesticide exposures. 
In addition to these policy changes, UFW and collaborating scientists help society understand pesticides as a public health issue. And this was done through a number of congressional hearings. While simultaneously prompting the public health sciences to recognize pesticide exposure as a political and economic issue related to the immigration status of farm worker labor. These events represent a second and often underappreciated root of the environmental justice movement and a significant contribution to our common health and well-being. Tying it back into this idea of interdisciplinary collaboration, intellectual ho hospitality, these histories and innovations in science and policy show what can emerge from, the, from this transdisciplinary dialogues involving workers, farm workers, social movement activists, academics, and policymakers, as well as business and industry as some of they begin to change. Um, it's worthwhile to remember that in addition to clean air, water, and, uh, and safer water, common goods include the civic dialogue and the search for truth itself. I would say, motivated by this call of diverse religious dialogues, our faculty collaborators plans to focus on empowered partnerships for environmental justice as a next step. And to this end, Chad Raphael's project will create an open source guide to fostering university community partnerships, and we will convene a conference um, that incorporates an Ignatian discernment process in the coming year. After listening to the EJ and Common Good Roundtable last February, Gustavo Aguirre from the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment said, I want royalties because you just told my life story. He grew up with his family, family farming in Mexico, migrated to the United States and picked fruit in California's Central Valley while organizing with Cesar Chavez, and then worked, as an, worked with attorney Lou Cole as they founded the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment and the California's legacy in the environmental justice movement. He'll be back on campus for an event on May 3rd. And I think Jesuit universities can learn a lot from the lives and stories of leaders like uh, Gustavo to help present and future generations achieve a just sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, very much indeed for your luminous and inviting thoughts. Uh, thank you, too, for our panelists. Uh, separately and together, you've given something to challenge us, um, something to encourage us, and everything to think about. Um, we, I'm going to make an executive decision here as executive director, which is I'm going to give us a little more time for a Q&A. Um, but uh, let me put this politely. I would warmly invite your focused and elegantly concise questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a terrific talk, Kristen. Um, it's so great to have you back on campus. Great thank you. <laughs> and thank you for everyone else's comments, too. Quick question. How far do you think the 28 Jesuit schools in the United States are in this issue? And do you feel like we're singing in harmony or uh, without uh, or dissonance? Can you get a sense of what do you think in terms of how we're doing as a whole in terms of the 28 schools? Sure. I want to keep the tone hopeful, but I know you, so I also want to be candid. I, I was telling the group about an hour ago that I think this is, has been particularly hopeful for me to observe and accompany a little bit from afar because more often um, I sense um, separate spheres operating on our campuses, um, maybe superficial engagement. I mean, in one sense, um, core curricula, or you know, in one sense, obviously we all do this in some way, and our students are integrating. Um, but the rhetoric around the common good, I think, is is more often fraught, not contested in some uh, fruitful tension or appropriate ways. I would. Um, but I was sharing last September that I was part of a pedagogy seminar at another Jesuit college or university um, where 
we were trying to revamp the core diversity requirement around an aegis of difference, justice, and the common good. So a group of, an interdisciplinary group of us were trying to revamp syllabi or create new courses. Um, and we had some shared texts um, and some fruitful conversations, but about half of the room said, the common good is fascism. And the other half of the room said, what's wrong with my syllabus that it only has dead white guys? You know, so the, <laughs> there was, um, that's when I started thinking the bilingual task is um, more difficult than at the theoretical level when we talk about the common good tradition in terms of our disciplines. In practice, I think it takes building trust. Folks today were saying this couldn't have happened if it weren't a two-year um, commitment. Um, I think it does take virtues, like I'm really struck what Sharmila just shared about in, uh, spiritual hospitality, you know, rather than tokenizing, or we should have this representation. Um, I think there's probably a lot about Teresa's vision and the spirit and the size of Santa Clara, but I'm afraid too often I'm, I'm part of another Catholic collaborative that's not just Jesuit that just met at Duquesne, and it was similarly um, divided around the value of why bother rehabilitating this, or it's been misused so much that it's been compromised, or people saying, I kind of don keywords on my um, far right to get an internal grant, but it doesn't kind of thoroughly reflect, the, I'm sure that would never happen here, but you know what I mean, but it doesn't kind of thoroughly orient my, um, my research and my outlook. I was really struck in one of the small groups today, I can't find her, Ira saying that participation returned her to why she got into this discipline to begin with, why she wanted to become a professor. So I just think there are some deep things that happened here. I'm sure they're happening in other 27 wonderful campuses, but I, to, if I'm being honest, I've been more struck by the intransigence of attitudes around this type of proposal. Um, so go Broncos. <laughs> Thank you. At the very back. Um, thank you to all the panelists, and it was good to be reminded of the other participants in the Bannon Institute over the last two years. Uh, my innate hopefulness uh, is somewhat uh, mediated by the fact that uh, even though we have wonderful students and staff and faculty who, are, who do think a lot about the common good, um, while Kristen was talking about people being, particularly younger people, being trapped in their technology. The young woman next to me, clearly a student, was surfing the web, <laughs> not paying attention. Um, I see more and more students being, I, we have the silos of information now with the, all the rhetoric about fake news and the various differing news sources people use, then we have people who genuinely are constantly on Facebook, constantly on Twitter, constantly on YouTube, constantly multitasking and not tasking well in any of those multiple areas, and with so little public rhetoric about the common good, let alone debates about what constitutes it, how what ways can we really try to bring people together? I, I literally assigned my students last week to go out and smell the roses. Because they all walk, almost all, they walk around campus glued to their phones. They don't talk to each other. They go out to dinner and they don't talk to each other. They're all on their phones. So how do we as faculty provide an antidote to that kind of being boxed in to not even a human world, but a world of pure technology and no real vision of a common good, a common discourse of the need to work together, apart from obviously wonderful groups of students like the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas survivors. Can I ask for one response to that, please? <laughs> give a quick response yeah. unless one of you wants to. I think you should keep assigning your students to smell the roses. I mean, I really do think I got more resistance when I taught with Dorian at LMU to my no technology policy than I do today. Like, I think we have a chance to habituate students differently. I think I've become more concerned about the deep lasting effects of this as a parent rather than a professor. Um, but I do think we have opportunities. Some of it is nature. Some of it I really worry about 
relationships. I mean, not just like, I know Karen Peterson Iyer has this assignment where students have to, maybe you still do this, have to go and on a regular old fashioned date. I mean, I don't think our students, when Sherry Turkle came to our campus said, nobody comes to my office hours. They're afraid of human interaction. There's a whole pedagogy behind that. I'm just trying to keep it brief for doing So um, I do think we have an opportunity to, to engage our students in different habits, um, not in a shaming way, although I'm a hardliner on electronics in the classroom, but also in an inviting way. That's what I was trying to show with, um, I don't know, a little Rachel Carson or having them smell the beautiful flowers or ask another human being to go out, not virtually, but engage real relationships. I mean, a lot of Laudato Si is also on cultivating real rather than virtual relationships, or Sabbath rest, like sabbaticals. I remember our own conference on BC's campus was when the supermoon came out. And I said, like, please go outside tonight and view the supermoon. Don't get a cool filter to get a great picture to put, or like look online, like experience the supermoon yourself. I think that they, they benefit from that, but you're right, it's an uphill battle. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I am keen to get the wonderful 24 Bannon Fellows fed and watered. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to say to our gathered guests, so thank you very much for accepting our hospitality and coming to this summit lecture. Um, I'd like you to encourage to use some technology, uh, which is to return to the Ignatian Center website where to, and to listen or to re-listen to the fantastic podcast series which have been made by our 24 Bannon Fellows. Um, uh, we have an upcoming issue of the Ignatian Center Journal Explore, and the new issue has essays by each one of the 24 Bannon Fellows. Um, I also want to say um, thank you to someone who I hope might sneak in in the back, which is Teresa. Um, clearly, uh, this has been, it is the fruit of her wonderful, wonderful vision. So, uh, remotely, uh, we wish her, I'm sure together we wish her well. Um, details of the Ignatian Center's work for 2018 to 19 and beyond that will be forthcoming on our website. So please visit it again and often. Um, to all of you here, please come back again and often to our events. And to Kristen particularly, please come back again and often <laughs> and avail yourself of our hospitality. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.